Hi, my name is Nick Godarzi. Welcome to our Precision Rifle Positional Training. Today we're out in the field at Blue Ridge Rifle Range and we're going to shoot from many different positions, natural terrain obstacles and barricades. I'm going to show you how I would approach, plan and make shots from many different positions. So for easier learning experience we're going to divide every stage into three sections. There's going to be an introduction to the, to the stage then it's going to be approach, how would I approach shooting the stage. It was going to be execution of the stage under time to simulate real match shooting conditions. So we're at this tire stage which consists of quite a few tires. We have to make shots on targets, frequently changing positions from tire to tire. Let's talk about what goes into planning on this stage. So when I plan on shooting the stage, what I go through is I'll physically go up to the barricade and make sure that it's possible to make a shot. In this scenario, we got bottom tires, we got a natural obstacle of grass, I can't shoot from the bottom tires. I'll have to execute all my shots from the start and the middle tires. Also, I'll see what gear I need. The mag, if you need any bags, I'll make sure to have that with me before I go on the stage. And if I don't think I don't need a bipod or something else on the rifle, I'll just go ahead and take it off. Because when you frequently change positions, this thing's just going to get caught and eat up your time. Now we have to execute shots from the stage, so let's get it on. When I go into shooting the stage, I'll set my rifle, line it up with the target. When I get down to my knee, I'll bring the right knee up for my elbow support. I like a wider stance. If you use a narrow stance, you're going to get a right to left wobble. The more you can widen out, the better. I'll get on target. I want my camera guide to show this knee. The better position for the knee to be is straight down from the body, straight in line. You don't want to bring that knee forward and then use muscle to support yourself. If you just straighten it out straight under your body, it's just bone on the ground and it's very stable. During the execution of the stage, you want to be very efficient with your gear. For example, in this tire, we could use another pillow to stabilize your rifle. As you go, and you line up on target, you use a pump pillow to stabilize yourself. This gives you a very stable platform. You got a bag underneath your rifle. Some of the positions will not let you use the bag. For example, this tire, if you use a bag, the rifle is too high. It's not a good idea. So you want to be very very efficient with your gear. In this tire I would just set the rifle and use the pump pillow for my elbow support to make the shot. This also would make a very stable platform. Time starts now. So we're at the stage where you got a chain stretch in between two posts. This is one of my favorite stages and this is what I practice on. You can see a rope. Uh, they use might be shooting out of a helicopter. They use ropes for support. Uh, if you're a hunter, you might use a rope between a couple of trees uh, to shoot over tall grass. The difficulty of this stage is you're going to get a lot of bounce. You're never going to be as stable as if you go prone. So there's a couple of techniques that, that I use when I shoot off of something. Uh, I got a rope or a chain in between two poles. What gear can I use to stabilize myself? I got a couple of bags here. I got my mag ready to go. You cannot go prone because of the natural obstacle, grass. You can't see the target. So we ha we're going to have to shoot off the chain. It's going to be bouncy. So my plan is to use a bag on top of the chain. I don't like to load or pull. We're just going to let that rifle sit on top of that chain. And we're just going to stabilize it and shoot it. 
Let me tell you how I plan to shoot this stage and how I'd get in the position. I'd set my rifle on the chain where it's nice and centered. This is going to be a good kneeling position. I'm going to go ahead and leave my bipod on for this one because I could use this just to grab under my rifle and just keep it into my shoulder and it'll help me with recoil management. This is going to be very bouncy during recoil. So this is what this position would look like. I want my camera guide to show you that you want your bottom end to be touching your foot. You don't want to use any muscle for support. Just go ahead and sit on your foot. That's going to give you a very nice stable position. Another position you may encounter when shooting off ropes or chains is you may have to shoot from a bottom uh, strung of a rope or a chain. In this position, I would use a bigger rear support bag. You can just set your rifle on the chain. You'd go prone. Use a bigger bag for support. What makes it difficult shooting off of a chain or a rope that's stretching between two poles is the bounce. After each shot, the rifle's gonna bounce. It's the job of the shooter to manage that recoil so you can stay on target and see your impact or misses so you can correct. Last tip before we leave that stage, when you're shooting off of a chain or rope, loading into the rifle doesn't really work. If you push into the rifle, you're just gonna create that much more up and down, a lot of vertical. You just wanna set that rifle down and let it just balance itself. Use the left hand, grab the bipod, and just give it a little pull into your shoulder. So you wanna be just like this. Time starts now. We're at this stage, it's called a moving platform. This would simulate uh, uh, shooting off of a boat if you're in the military, you might have to engage a target from a moving boat or a moving vehicle maybe. So uh, it's just moving a lot. It's very difficult stage. Let's talk about how we would approach engaging this. You don't really need a lot of gear for this stage. You just need some patience and a rear bag. When you get on it, it's gonna move. So you wanna get on it nice and slow. You don't wanna rattle this thing to where it's unstoppable. Let's execute it. When you get on this platform, just go ahead and be nice and slow. The less movement, the better. Get your rear support in there. When you look through the reticle, the reticle is just up and down, side to side. It's just wobbling all over the place. You want to settle down for a second. Let it just settle itself down. It's going to be more of a timing shot. When you're on target, you're going to pull the trigger. When you take a shot from a platform that's moving, and when you manipulate that bolt, I suggest that you just go a little slower than usual. Any little movement that you do makes that platform move even more. So be nice and smooth when you reload shot to shot. Time starts now. Here we got a stage where you got three different levels. It'll simulate shooting off of a fence or fence posts or different elevations. Uh, and let's talk about how I would approach to shooting this. Uh, 
Uh, so on this stage, I would utilize a couple bags. One of the bags I would utilize to set underneath my rifle. If you shoot off of a metal or a hard surface, you're going to get a lot of bounds on the rifle. If you use a bag underneath your rifle, that's just going to give you that extra support, minimize that bounce. Also, when you transfer to the bottom, you can also use it. And for the bottom position, you can use that bag. And we'll use that bag to stabilize your body, putting the elbow on it. Let me show you how. So when we build a position shooting off three different levels, we'll need to make sure that we manage our gear uh, top notch. We don't want the bags falling over bags falling uh, where we can't reach them. We want to make sure we just do the best we can. This is how I would do it. We want to make sure in this position we lock our knees out. We make as wide as of a stance as we need to get in the right elevation. We don't want to use muscle bend or knees to stabilize. You're going to get fatigued and you're going to start being uh, shaky. So lock your knees out, lean into the rifle. That makes a very good position. Second position, I'll just set the bag. It's going to be a kneeling position. Sit right on your foot, elbow on the knee. That makes it very nice and stable. Third position, set the bag down. We're just going to have to lean to the side a bit. We could use this bag to stabilize our elbow. makes it for very stable shot. Sometimes the position will dictate your shooting location and what would that require you to use your weak side to make a shot as it's impossible to get strong side to, to make the shot. So you're going to use your support side I would use a bag, and this is how I'd build that position. Same thing applies, lock your knees out. You don't want to use any muscle. Lean into the rifle, straight behind the gun. It actually makes it a very good, stable position. Time start now. If you're going to shoot any kind of match, PRS style matches, you're going to encounter this obstacle. It's a wire reel. It does make it a pretty challenging position to shoot off of. There's a couple of elements of instability that you're going to encounter. One of them is this thing wants to roll on you. Uh, it's not a very stable, it just wants to go forward or backwards. It's not a very big platform also. You only get a little bit of a rounded position to shoot off of. So your gun wants to, you don't really have a rear and support, front and rear support. The gun wants to tip on you. So it's, it makes it pretty tough challenging, but there's a couple of tips I can give you to make it easier on you. I would just use a bag. What that bag offers you is a little bigger platform to support your rifle. You don't want to support it off of a rounded reel. That does not offer a lot of stability. If you're a hunter, you could just throw your backpack on there that backpack being a little bigger and longer would support your rifle a little better. This is how the position would look. I would use a pump pillow for my elbow and go ahead and lean your body into the wire reel and that would stop that reel from rolling. You just make sure you got a good contact and that way your position is solid. Time starts now. Here we got a stairs. We got to shoot from three different positions. What makes it real challenging is there's not a lot of room to put a bag underneath. Otherwise you're going to block your scope. You won't be able to see a target. So the trick here is to build some kind of support on the rear of your rifle. And it's about gear management.
you just want to get into position faster, quick, make sure you just get shots on target. Let me I'm going to go ahead and get rid of my bipod. It's not going to help me any. This is how the position would look like. We'll use a pump bellow for rear support. We could use steps to get our elbows planted in there. That does make it for a good solid position. We got rear support, our elbows got support. To transfer into the other stairs, do the same thing, except you're gonna have to be seated. You can use your foot as support. That makes it a pretty good stable position. Shooting from the bottom. We're just gonna use a pump pillow for rear support. Elbows on the ground, square to the gun. We got another challenging stage here. Let me show you. We got this tire that just hangs on a couple chains. It swings back and forth. It doesn't offer a lot of support for your rifle. So it's pretty challenging. There's a couple tricks that we could use to, to support ourselves, the rifle, to make an accurate shot. This position is gonna depend how well you can stabilize yourself. So I'd get in here. My rifle's gonna go on the tire. I'm gonna lean against any support I can, anything that's gonna offer me any support. <clears throat> Another thing that's gonna offer us a little bit of support, when you put your mag in and you slide your rifle forward, that mag on the tire offers just a little bit of that extra stability that you need to make a shot on a small target. When you're shooting from small places, confined places where it's nice and tight, you use that to, you, to your advantage. Over here, I got this two by. I can use that to support my elbow. And that just offers a little more stability. Just like I'm shooting, I'm, I'm using this to support myself. You use this for your elbow. And that makes it a pretty stable position. Time starts now. <clears throat> In planning stages of shooting the tank trap, uh, what I plan is, and usually you'll see that at a match, they'll, they'll have you shoot from three different positions, uh, usually from the center of the tank trap, from one of the tips, and then they'll, they'll have you shoot one of the, off of one of the slope legs of the tank trap. And there's a couple of tricks in, in the bag that we employ to, uh, to make that happen, make an accurate shot off of it. To get in the position to shoot from the center of the tank trap, the rifle will be on the bag. This is gonna be your kneeling position. I like to run my hand on top of the scope to support the rifle. It gives you a little bit of right and left with your hand. You just get behind the rifle. That offers a, a really good stable shooting position. We'll go to the tip of the tank trap. You wanna use some kind of bag or a backpack to give you a little bit of a stability on that tip. We'll set the rifle on top of the bag. We'll start squaring up on the rifle. I'll lock my knees out and just lean into the rifle. Hand on top of the scope. Knees locked out, squared to the rifle. That offers a really stable position. To shoot one of the, off of one of the slope uh, legs of the 
tank trap. It gets a little trickier, but you just set that bag. It's gonna be a kneeling position. You can control the elevation with this hand. I'll usually grip the tank trap, and that will also support the bag, and it'll kind of stop it at the elevation that I need. I could use my elbow for knee support, or off a of knee support. And this makes it a pretty stable position too. Time starts now. This is a typical prone position. You have to understand that during the match, you won't get a lot of time to build that position perfect, but you have to make sure your fundamentals are there. So practice that. Get in the position fast. Create a wide base. Get behind the rifle. Make sure your elbows are on the ground. Make sure you're straight behind the gun. Build that position fast. Let's take a couple shots from that position. Recoil management is everything in this position. You want to make sure you stay on target, stay on the rifle, spot your shot, whether it's an impact or a miss, so you can make a correction. We're going to talk about standing, kneeling, and sitting position. It's all offhand. Uh, some of the matches don't allow any kind of support, bags, so it's just going to be you and the rifle. Now I'm going to show you how I do to build that position and make an accurate shot. For standing, I'll place my feet facing 90 degrees to the target by shoulder width. I'm going to take my left hand and I'm going to run it on my hip as much as I can and have that hip support my hand. It'd be as such. And I'm going to start above the target and I'm going to slowly come down on the target. Close the bolt. Pull the trigger. Next one is going to be a kneeling position. You're just gonna go kneeling. I'm gonna lay my right foot flat and I'm just gonna sit right on it. My right foot flat, my bottom sitting right on the foot. Now I'm gonna bring my left knee up around my left elbow on my knee as a support. This left hand's gonna support most of your rifle but it is supported by the knee. Close the bolt. Start above the target. Make a shot, recover, run the bolt. This does makes it a pretty stable position. It's always a good idea to support bone on bone when you go elbow on your knee. For sitting position, you're just going to go ahead and sit on your bottom. I'm going to run my left foot all the way underneath my right foot. Likewise, the right foot underneath my left to get my knees support for my elbows. And then I'm going to run my elbows on my knees. And I got my left foot supporting this elbow, my right foot supporting this elbow. So my elbows are all supported, bone on bone. I'm going to go ahead and close the bolt. Start above the target. Run the bolt. That makes it a pretty stable position.
There's another way to shoot standing, kneeling, and sitting, and that's using a sling. I use a bungee sling. It's got a little bit of a bungee motion, so it kind of tightens up the rifle. You don't have to have it perfectly adjusted. This bungee will kind of let it get into position. So let me demonstrate how you use a sling. Wrap your hand around the sling. As you go up, the sling is going to tighten up everything. It's going to pull that rifle into your shoulder. As you come down, you bring your elbow in, and that tightens up the sling. For kneeling position, we're going to sit on the foot. That elbow being in front of the sling, when you put it on your knee and you bring it over, it's going to tighten up everything. It's going to tighten up the sling around your neck, and that's going to support the rifle. Same thing, you're going to rest your elbow on your knee. The sling's just going to help you stabilize it a little better. For sit position, same thing, you're going to bring your right, left foot underneath your right, right foot underneath your left. When you bring your elbow and put it on your knee, that sling is going to tighten up everything. It's going to pull the gun back into your shoulder. It's going to make a pretty stable position. You got this elbow, this elbow on your knee, and the sling pulling back makes it a nice position. This is a typical PRS positional barricade. It's, a, it's kind of a time event. It's used for tie breakers. Uh, so what you want to make sure that you're very, very efficient time-wise on this, get in and out of positions fast. There's typically four positions. Be one, two, three, four. Uh, usually it's a 90 second event. So you got to be able to get in there, two shots from each position, get in there and be efficient with time. Usually you get only 90 seconds to complete that whole stage. I got a couple of tips uh, and I'm going to show you a couple of things that I do to get through it and get, get hits on target. To get in position one, throw my bag down, my rifle goes on top of the bag, typical kneeling position. Elbow's going to go on your knee, make sure your butt is on your foot. Don't use any muscle to support yourself. I usually run hand on top of the scope. It's a pretty stable position. Recoil management is really good because you're behind the rifle. Get in position two. Throw it back up here. Rifle goes on top of the bag. Square behind the rifle. I'll lock my knees out. Lean into the gun. Close the bolt. That's pretty good in stable position. This is the standing position, square to the gun, lock your knees out, rifle goes on top of the bag, hand top of the scope, recoil management. Moving to the last position, rifle on top of the bag is going to be your kneeling position. Remember your elbow support, your foot supports the bottom, close the bolt. Very stable position. Make sure you support bone to bone. Time starts now.
This is a, a, a typical shoot house that you'll see at all the matches or some of the matches, most of the matches, but uh, they utilize many different positions, but you'll see at least four different positions. They can be prone, they can be sitting, kneeling, you can be standing up on top. There's a lot of movement. There's uh, absolutely needs to be a good, good gear management. You don't leave nothing behind, but you don't take too much extra. So you, you got to fit in some tight places and you got to do it under time. So gear management is important on this one, especially. Now we're going to show you a couple different positions, uh, how we shoot it and what I would do to make sure I get through it and don't time out. Since we're not going to shoot prone, I'm just going to go ahead and take my bipod off. All that's going to do is just hinder your ability to get into these tight ports. My position number one is going to be, I'm going to sit, I'm going to use these supports to lean on them, I'm going to support my elbow off my knee, and make a shot that way. We have to move, make sure your bolt's back, muzzle down range, you get into the position number two. This is going to be a typical kneeling position. From here we'll go up the top. We're gonna use a bag on this one. Score up behind the rifle. Hand on top of the scope. This is a pretty stable position. Last position, we're gonna go off the tire. I'm gonna throw a bag. We're gonna score up as much as we can. Lean into the gun. Use the support for your elbow. Very stable position. Before RO calls time starts now, he's going to ask you if a shooter's ready. This is the time to make sure your mag is in, your dope is dialed, caps are open. Make sure your rifle is ready for the stage. Time starts now. We'll put our elbow on this, use it as support. Don't close your bolt till you're on target. When we're on target, we'll take a shot. We're at the rooftop stage, and even though there's a couple of different ways of shooting the rooftop, it all depends on the angle of the rooftop. By far, my favorite way to shoot it is I put my rifle forearm on the edge of the rooftop and I use a bag for rear support. If the rooftop gets a little steeper, uh, you may not have enough of rear support. In that case, I'll just run a reaser bag on the edge. My rifle will just ride the bag as such, and that's if the, if the rooftop is steep. Let me just show you how I shoot it. When I shoot a rooftop, I just take a bigger rear bag for rear support. I do leave my bipod on, and the reason for that is I hook it on the edge of the roof and that just gives me something to, if I start sliding off, it just gives me some kind of support so I don't slide off with the rifle. You put a bag behind, you kind of kneel behind the rifle, straight behind the rifle, and this makes it a very stable position. I got rear support, my rifle supported by the edge of the rooftop, I got bipod there to keep me from sliding backwards, I'm ready to go.
Time starts now. Sooner or later, you'll run into a position where you have to shoot uh, off a slope. You'll be on a, on a slope hillside. You have to shoot at a target straight away. This is a pretty good position. I utilize a, a, a taller bipod, palm pillow in the back. It looks like this. And then I hook my feet to keep the bipod from sliding. I hook my feet into the bipod. I can make a pretty accurate shot in this position. My elbow supported by the pillow. I got some support off this knee. It feels pretty good, very stable. If you're on a hillside and you gotta shoot uphill at a target that's located uphill, another position that I utilize pretty often, especially in the field matches, is I'll lay back, use the back for rear support, make a shot from this position. I have a pretty good angle. I'm located on the slope and I can shoot uphill. Very good and stable position. I can make a, a pretty long shot from this position. There's another way of shooting uh, from a slope uh, rooftop or a slope hillside is utilize a, a tripod. The tip using the tripod is you wanna make sure that you got one leg forward and the two supporting legs aren't facing towards the shooter. And the reason for that is you wanna have a room for that gun to recoil back. If you have a leg straight, straight back, that recoil is not gonna be straight back. It's gonna be off to the side. So two legs back, one leg forward. Using the pump pillow to build a little bit of position in the back for rear support. I can make pretty accurate shots using the tripod. If you're shooting from a really steep hillside, uh, you got some snow or mud and the tripod wants to slide on you. Another thing I'll do is I'll have it hooked up with my feet. I'll hook up the right foot on this leg and this foot will hook up this leg. I'll use the bipod and just slightly give it a pull back into my shoulder and that way the tripod stays put when I shoot and during recoil it won't slide away from me. Another position that you'll run into is you have to shoot 90 degrees to the slope of the rooftop. What I do is on my bipod, I'll run one of the legs short I can, the other one's going to go long I can, just to give me a level platform on the slope rooftop. Using the bigger pump pillow, elbow's going to connect on the rooftop. You got pump pillow for rear support. I'm ready to go. Time starts now. Tripod is a pretty important tool in my backpack when I go to a match. If you have to shoot over tall grass or a tall obstacle, you can use the tripod to shoot standing. There's a couple of tricks that I can show you to make it easier to shoot from a tall tripod standing. You want those two legs to come back towards you. You want to allow for a recoil. You don't want that single leg coming back because that recoil is not going to be straight back. When I use the tripod standing shooting, I score up to the gun, keep my knees locked out just slight lean into the gun i do use the front bipod just to give it a little pull back into my shoulder Another reason why I like to 
grab my bipod on the front, it creates that triangle between me and the rifle, minimizes right or left uh, wobble. It's pretty solid if I grip on the, on the bipod as such. Last thing is shooting from a tripod standing is if you're crunching under time, you got to set it up fast. You don't really know what kind of elevation you need it at. I set it up to where the top of the hog saddle is about chest high. What that gives me is just I have to bend so slightly into the gun. I don't have to use muscle to support my back. My knees are locked out. Legs are spread about shoulder width. I get in the gun. I'm ready to go. You know, you can use the tripod standing, kneeling, sitting, shooting on the hillside, on the slope, rooftop. Another one I wanted to show you is how you can use the tripod, is if you got to shoot over an obstacle or, or short wall or short support of some sort, is to use one of the legs of the tripod as a rear support. Let me show you how. This will be a kneeling position. I'll grab one of those legs of my tripod grip it with my thumb against the leg. My bipods are extended out. I'm high off the ground. I can get over an obstacle, but my rear support is solid with the tripod. You can also control your elevation. You can pan a little bit right, left. You got flexibility with it. If you shoot matches, sooner or later you'll have to shoot from a vehicle or a truck. Uh, a couple of positions that they utilize shooting from a truck is shooting from a door when a door is open. Sometimes they'll put you inside of the truck, close the door, and you'll have to shoot from a door when it's closed. Or you'll have to climb in the bed of the truck and shoot off the bed of the uh, rail of the bed. Uh, we're going to show you a couple positions and what gear I use to make that shot. Shooting from a, an open door. If you just support your rifle from the door, it's gonna be a hard position to make a shot. We could use some kind of bag just to build up that platform, make it a little wider. You can lean on the seat, get into the rifle. And that's a good position right over here. If you just try standing, it gets a little wobbly. I do lean on the door out a little bit, push it out to the limits. With my uh, butt on the seat, I'm ready to go. Shooting from the inside of the car or a truck when the door is closed is I'll usually utilize the mirror. Just gives me a little more elevation. I'll still have a bag here to support my rifle. Most of your support is going to come from back here, your elbow being on the door, or maybe you run a little back underneath the butt stop. The position looks like this. You don't do anything specific with your feet. You just uh, sit on the seat, lean on the door. Your support mostly comes from the door, your elbow, your hand, or arm being on the, on the door. Shooting from the inside of the truck, it's gonna be a pretty small confined space. So you don't wanna take an extra gear. Just take exactly what you need. Manage that gear very good. You don't have a lot of room in there to put backpacks and all kinds of bags. I usually take one bag. My time starts now. We are at the stage where a match director is trying to simulate a stump. We've got a tall grass, we've got to engage a target out there. So we're going to have to get up a little higher. We don't have a tripod or a bipod, we're hunting. So the way we're going to shoot off of a stump, I'm going to lay my bag, create a little better platform, a little bigger platform. I'm just going to kneel down, support my elbow with my knee, get my butt on my foot, on my left foot. I'm just going to get comfortable. And that feels pretty good to take a, a shot. 
My time starts now. We've got to get in position. We're under time, we've got to make a shot. I'm gonna make another shot. Shooting from around at surface is such as this big old pipe. I would not use a bipod, I'd rather use a, ba use a bag. Let me show you why. If you use a bipod, bipod and you have a magazine in, and you're trying to engage the target, you, your magazine is going to run into the pipe, not giving you a very good support. So you're going to be floating on top of the magazine. What I would do is I would get rid of the bipod or fold it forward. Using the bag lets you pan over to engage one target. You can pan over and engage another target and it's a very solid position. Elbow on your knee, if I'm going to shoot straight out. If I'm going to pan over and shoot at a target angle to the left or right of the pipe, I'm going to run my elbow and support it off the pipe as such. That offers me a very good rear support. I can make accurate shots with this. Time starts now. I get over to the pipe, set the bag, set the rifle, pan over to my target, elbow on the pipe. At this stage, we've got a tire that's just laying flat. We have to engage some targets out there. So we're gonna to try to get in a position, re use a rear bag for rear support, bipod on the front. Let me show you how. We've got the bipod out. We're gonna extend it out a little bit. Set it over here. I'm gonna use the rear bag. make it very solid position. We're going to try to get into position pretty fast. This might be a part of a stage, so last position of the stage, we're going to try to make a quick shot. So my time starts now. We want to thank you for joining us for this precision rifle training. I hope that you found it helpful to further your shooter skill. Today we showed you what it takes to shoot from improvised position and what gear we use to stabilize yourself. Ultimately, it's up to you to get out, invest into your training, invest time, get out, dry fire, and practice more. I'll see you at the next match, and remember, the miss is not an option. So today we're in my reloading room. This is where all the reloading, all the magic happens. I'm gonna to talk to you today about the equipment, the components that I use to make my competition loads. The two popular cartridges in the PRS shooting or any match shooting is a 6.5 millimeter and a six millimeter. I personally chose a six millimeter. I choose a six by 47 or a six XC. And the reason for that is because of its amazing ballistics and its ability to cut through the wind. We have a 6XC on the right and 6x47 on the left. They're very similar and their ballistics are very similar also. I want to show you the components that I use to put my competition load together. 
So I use a 6 5 by 47 brass. I neck it down to a 6 millimeter to make it 6 by 47. I use CCI 450 primers. The new Nosler RDF bullet because of its amazing ballistic coefficient. I use a Redding 6 by 47 full size die. For this case I, I chose H4350 powder. Some people choose Varget. I think this is a more popular powder. Right now I'm going to show you the process that I use to put the cases and the bullets together. So when I get, get back from a match I use a Frankfurt Arsenal to clean the brass and then I throw it in some kind of dehydrator to dry it up. It goes through my resizing die. I push the shoulder a couple thousands back, make sure it all fits. And then I use my Gerard trimmer to trim, deburr, and chamfer all my cases. And then all that, that seat the primer, drop the powder, and load the bullet. So the fundamentals of reloading is what I call two C's. It's gotta be concentricity and consistency. You got to be consistent and your load's got to be concentric. There are many ways of cleaning brass, there's many ways of trimming brass and dropping powder, but the name of the game is, game is consistency. So right now I want to talk to you about how I develop a load for a brand new case that I'm not familiar with. So let's take for example a 6x47. So I know the velocity that I want to be at 3000 or 3020, somewhere in there. So I'll take 8 or 10 cases. I'll load, I'll start at the lowest recommended uh, loading and I'll load half a grain increment increasing uh, and I'll shoot them through a chronograph and I'll see what grain gives me the velocity that I want to be and then I'll develop my ro load around that grain just to get that velocity that I like and you know I might increase half a grain, I might decrease half a grain just to, just to stay within the safe velocity for travel and, and different environmental conditions. So the question comes up is how accurate of a rifle do you need to compete in PRS or any tactical matches? And the answer to that is my personal, and this is what, what I do for me, is uh, uh, it's acceptable for me to shoot half MOA. Right now I want to share some of the tips and tricks that I use in my reloading procedure. Uh, the bullets that I used to shoot, uh, I used to tip them. So tipping a bullet, what that means is you use a special die or a tipping die to close the tip of the bullet and so you just close up that tip of the bullet uh, improves your ballistic coefficient by seven to ten percent uh, and also makes the noses of the bullets consistent so when I seat a bullet into my case what I pay attention to is the force or the pressure that it takes to seat the bullet and that's what it's called the neck tension so I pay attention to the neck tension and make sure my bullets all are seating with the same pressure or same force on, on, on the uh, on the handle that helps your cases be all consistent and you, you will get a good spread in your velocity I personally don't turn necks for, for the name of the game that I play uh, as long as my bullets are seating with the same neck tension, with the same pressure, and if I check them on the concentricity gauge and my bullets all concentric to the center of the case, I don't feel there's a need to turn necks. Another tip to be consistent with your reloads is to identify and mark your brass before you go to a match. You don't want to come back from a match and bring somebody else's brass and try to reload because that's not how you stay consistent. So how I mark my cases is I just put a little mark to identify which is my case and make sure I take that case home with me. My personal opinion on the barrel break-in is if you buy a quality hand lap barrel that doesn't have any machining tool marks or any kind of marks on the lands or grooves, it does not need uh, a specific barrel break-in. So I just take my barrel, I shoot 50-60 rounds through it, maybe develop a load, shoot 50-60 more rounds. I try not to take a barrel or a rifle to a match that has less than 150 rounds. What I do to make sure my loads are all consistent is I stretch them out to a distance. I think that's just going to be the, the final word 
whether your loads are consistent or not. So our, I'll shoot a couple groups at a thousand yards and make sure I don't have any vertical depression, make sure my velocity is consistent, my loads are consistent, and then you should be able to uh, get really nice groups if you stay consistent throughout your reloading process. One important aspect of your match shooting and competition career is having a good gunsmith and having a good relationship with your gunsmith. Uh, just I'm lucky in that sense because he's right next door to me. This man right here, uh, I trust him with my life because he builds all my guns from ground up. And the tip of the day is don't piss off your gunsmith because he can make your life miserable. I, and my part of it, building guns all my life, having a shooter of Nick's ability that can push my barrels to the limit and experiment with different loads and I've learned a lot just by having a quality shooter like Nick shoot my barrels. So we've learned from each other and we've gained a lot of ground on this uh, PRS shooting. And thanks to people like Nick and the PRS, we've come a long ways in the, in the gunsmith world. Hi, my name is Nick Godarzy and welcome to the wind tutorial. Today we're going to talk about a wind and effect that it has on your bullet and the way that we can compensate for a bullet drift. So let's talk about a basic concept of how the wind affects your bullet during the flight. So I believe that the closer wind to the muzzle has more effect on your bullet than the wind that's at the target. And to kind of help you understand that, I have a basic concept to show you. To help you understand the more importance of a closer wind to the shooter and effect on the bullet, we have a simple visual for you to see. And imagine the pool table and that ball being your bullet. As it leaves the muzzle and it gets deflected closer to the muzzle and that angle of deflection, that bullet's gonna remain in that angle longer than if that bullet was deflected later in flight. So the closer wind's gonna deflect that bullet off its path more than a later wind. There's a couple simple tools that I use to make initial wind call. One of them is being a Kestrel. That's gonna help me measure the wind at my location. The other one is I'm gonna take a good pair of glass or binoculars. I'm gonna look down range. I'm gonna look at the target location. I'm gonna look about in the middle and see if I see any vegetation and see if I uh, can pick up any mirage. Another simple tool that I could use is just this little powder. And as, as you can see, that powder will give me a, and confirm that wind direction. And the last thing I look is at, at the terrain that I'm shooting in because wind, it will follow that terrain. So if your target's located up on the, on the, on the slope, that most likely that wind is gonna bump up your bullet. It's gonna pick it up. It's gonna give it a little bit of a lift. So more, more, more chances you're gonna miss high on that target. Not only right, but it'll also go high. I also use this Windicator powder. And why it's important to look at the terrain is because if you look at the powder, the way it flows, it, it's gonna follow that terrain straight down. It's not, the wind doesn't blow straight across. It will follow a terrain, whether it's down or up. And if you're shooting from this location and you got wind, it possibly can pull your bullet down also. It can downdraft. And once you get to the other side, it's gonna updraft on the bullet. Another simple field trick you could use, just pick up some grass, toss it up in the air, and you can watch and get that wind direction. And you can also see how it follows that terrain. So it's good to have all the gadgets, but what do you do? How do you figure out the wind speed if you don't have all the gadgets? And, and that's where I turn into vegetation. I'll look at the grass and, the, and trees and, and anything that I could pick up any wind speed from. If I'm looking at the grass and the grass is moving so slightly, then I'll make a decision it's a three to five mile an hour wind. And if that grass is kind of starting to lay down a little bit, then it's, we're talking about seven to 10 mile an hour wind. 
if that grass is starting to wave down and it's like wave, that wind goes over the grass like waves, it's 15 to 20 miles an hour. And then I'll make a, I'll take a look at down the range, middle, middle of the range about, and then I'll try to pick up trees or anything that's going to tell me wind speed. And so looking at the trees, if the leaves are moving so slightly, then it's three to five mile an hour. And if that tree is starting to move and the branches are moving, then it's five to seven to eight miles an hour. And if that tree is starting to lean over, then we're talking about 15 to 20 mile an hour wind. Depending on what time of the year you're making a shot, you can also use weather conditions to figure out the wind direction and wind speed. Let's say if you got snow or rain, and you can watch the angles of the snow or rain or fog. If, if that snow has got 5, 10 degrees to it, then you got 3 to 5 miles an hour. If it's got you know, 20, 25, 30 degrees, then you got 10, 12 miles an hour. And if that snow is just going sideways, then you got 15 to 20 mile an hour wind. And that's what's going to help you figure out the wind speed down between the shooter and the target. So you look at the vegetation and you look at everything, you made your initial wind call. You made a decision whether you're gonna hold for wind or dial, and then you, you engage the target. And so it's important to watch what happens when your bullet impacts down at the target location. So I've made my initial wind speed call. Now I can use the clock method to put it in into my ballistic calculator to tell me how much I need to compensate for wind. There's a couple of methods of compensating, whether you can dial your turret for wind or you can hold for wind. So let's talk about using a clock method for wind direction and wind value. So imagine a, just a clock. The shooter is always going to be at 6 o'clock. The target is always going to be at 12 o'clock. 9 o'clock, 3 o'clock, those are going to be a full value winds and anything between 9 and 12 and 3 and 6, that's all going to be half value wind. Earlier in the video, we mentioned two methods of compensating for wind. One of them is being dialing your windage turret. So if you got a wind coming from 9 o'clock, which means the wind is coming from the left, you will dial your turret left. If the wind is coming from 3 o'clock, which means from the right, you will dial your turret right. There's different manufacturers of scopes, and it could be different directions for right and left. So once you consult, your manual to see what way you need to dial your turret to go right or left. Another method to compensate for wind is using your reticle. If you have subtensions in your reticle, and let's say the wind is coming from nine o'clock, which means from left, you would hold left into the wind, whatever value you need to hold. And if the wind is coming from three o'clock, which means from right, your reticle would be shifting to the right to compensate for wind. You made all your initial wind calls, now it's time to take a shot. So you took a shot. It's important to watch the splash of the bullet, whether you impacted the target or you missed the target, so you can make a correction. You can watch that splash, because it'll give you a direction of the wind at the target. It could be going up, or it could be going right or left. So that would help you make the correction for the second shot. Don't be confused if you impact above the target or you hit high or right or left. Wind can play with elevation of your bullet as you could take it right or left. So just make a correction and make a second shot. So to make a correction for a second shot if you have to miss the target, you can use your subtensions on your reticle to measure what your bullet impacted to the center of the target. And you can also dial that into your turret for a second shot or just hold it over on your reticle. Your target location may not provide you the best bullet splash and it's important to learn how to watch bullet trays. You can even watch that bullet being deflected from the wind as it goes to your target to make a good correction. As the bullet flying through the air, it creates disturbance and that's what's called trace. So let's take a closer look at trace and how it could help you make an accurate shot in a windy condition. Let's say you encounter a situation where you're shooting five, 600 yards, you don't have a bank, you got grassy hillside, 
and you won't be able to see a bullet splash. So that's where you really have to rely on trace to be able to make a correction. So what can you do as a shooter to spot trace better? We're gonna shoot about 600 yards. We've got a little bit of left to right wind. I'm gonna back my power out on my scope to about 15 to 18 power, and depending on the scope, it might be a little different. I'm gonna settle my crosshair on the target. As soon as I break that shot, I'm gonna look up above my crosshair a couple feet, and that could be different depending on distance and caliber. And I'm gonna catch that trace going to the target. And I'm gonna to try to follow it all the way to the target. On the video, you'll see the tray start right in the middle of the target, and as the wind affects the bullet, the bullet's going to drift, and you'll see the trace drift to the right. Let me demonstrate. Few things you got to remember when you're trying to spot trace. One of them is different weather conditions are going to affect trace differently. Some weather conditions will make it harder to see, easier to see. So you got to get out and practice shooting and spotting your own trace in different weather conditions, whether it's snow, rain, sunshine. Another thing that comes into mind is recoil management is very important for spotting trace and also not flinching. And you got to be able to stay on scope to be able to catch that trace and follow it all the way to the target. The wind is the hardest element to nail down when it comes to shooting. And so what do I do to better up my skills is I get outside. When the weather sucks, when it's raining, when it's foggy, when it's time to sit by the fireplace, I go outside, go by the canyon, bring my binos, bring my wind meter. I'll make initial wind call and then I'll get out and measure it. And that's how I try to get, develop a natural feeling for the speed of the wind. Uh, you can read about the wind, you can study, you can tell, have people tell you how to read the wind, but there is no substitute of getting out and shooting. So don't be scared of the weather. Leave the fireplace behind and go outside. Practice the wind. Hi, my name is Dick Adarzi and I want to welcome you to a moving target tutorial. Today we're going to talk about how to approach a stage where you have to shoot a moving target, how you shoot a mover when you got wind involved, and we're going to demonstrate with a rifle how we shoot a mover. Right now I want to talk about a most common mover that you will see at matches is the mover that's a parallel to the shooter. It does not have a lot of elevation change and it does not shorten or lengthen the yardage of the mover. It just basically goes right to left to left to right. Uh, and like I said, there's not much changes to it. There's a couple of different techniques in shooting the mover that's a parallel to the shooter. And one of them is trapping the moving target. And the other one is leading the target. What that means is when you trap in the moving target, you move your crosshair ahead of the moving target and when that moving target comes into an appropriate lead that you want to hold on it, you break a shot. When you're trying to lead a moving target, what that means is your crosshair is moving with the target. Usually you'll go right past it, and when your lead comes to an appropriate length, then you break the shot. So when you show up to a stage that's got a moving target, there's a couple things you'll need to figure out. Is one of them, and probably the most important one, is how much do you lead, or how much lead do you need in front of the moving target? to impact. And that's going to be determined by distance of the mover, by speed of the mover, and if you got any wind involved, you're going to have to take that into the calculations. You will encounter different speeds uh, movers at matches. Most often you're going to be at three miles an hour. It's going to be a walking speed mover. And then some of them may be six to eight miles an hour. That's going to be a running speed mover. Uh, those will take a little different lead to engage. So we got an in-motion target mover 
at 580 yards we've got a confirmation target at same distance about 10 yards to the right of the mover so we're going to shoot confirmation target to make sure our elevation is correct and make sure our wind is dialed so once we figured out what the wind is we're going to dial it into the windage turret and we're going to hold lead on the mover in our reticle In order to engage a mover and make impacts, you need to know what the lead is. Since that target is moving, you will have to lead it. I personally like to ambush the moving target. That means I'd like to pick a location, I center up my crosshair. When that mover comes in and I got the, the lead that I want to hold on to, it, I break the shot. In order to figure out what the lead is, you need to know the mover speed and the distance to the mover. And you can use your ballistic calculator to figure all that out, what the lead is. In this scenario, we got a mover at 580 yards. We're gonna do about 1.5 mils to center lead. Once in a while, you will encounter a mover that has a variable speed. That means that speed of the mover will change. It could change in the beginning, it could change in the middle, or it can change in the end, or it can go one speed one way and come back with another, to another speed. As a shooter, what I try to do is with my peripheral vision, I try to keep an eye on the speed of the mover. And if I see any changes in the speed of the mover, I adjust my lead accordingly. Sometimes you will encounter a mover that's not perfectly parallel to the shooter. That means the moving target's gonna be moving not only right to left, but it also is gonna be a moving away from the shooter. As a shooter, you need to be able to identify that. Usually I'll range the mover in the middle. And as that mover is going away, I not only hold my lead to the right, but it will also add to the elevation. As that mover is coming closer, you will need to take some of that elevation off when you hold the lead. When you're shooting the mover and you sometimes will be ahead of it, there's a couple things you can do whether you're ahead of it or behind it. If you're ahead of it, you'll need to decrease your lead. And if you're behind it, you need to increase your lead. Also, when you're shooting a moving target, you need to be aggressive on the trigger. That means as soon as that lead is where you want to hold on the target, you need to go ahead and break the shot. Now we're ready to shoot a mover. So now I can see that I missed the mover behind. I either have to increase my lead or my reaction time. I shot in front of the mover, so that means I either have to decrease my lead or my reaction time. Now was a good center shot. If you're going to shoot matches, you're going to encounter a moving target that's placed in front of a tree line or a grassy hillside. And you will not be able to spot your miss splash, whether you're in front of or behind the target. And that's where you can rely on trace to be able to spot if your timing is correct to hit that mover target. Let's look at the mover out there. After you figure out what your lead is on the mover, and that's going to be depending on the distance, you break a shot and you can follow your own trace looking through the scope. And if you miss that target, you can make a correction whether you want to increase or decrease your lead.
Today we're out in the field practicing with a spinner target. And the spinner target is usually a target that's a couple feet long. It's got a bigger target on the bottom, smaller target on top, and it spins on the axis or a bar of some sort. And you have to hit it at a perfect timing to make it spin. And why it's important to practice it is because most spinners will take a few well-placed shots and well-timed shots to make it spin. Why is it benefit to practice a spinner? Because it teaches you trigger control bolt manipulation and you have to be accurate while you're running that bolt pretty fast trying to keep up with the spinner. Spinner targets becoming more and more popular at precision rifle matches and it's a tough target especially for a beginner shooter. You deal with a lot of fast shooting, fast bolt manipulation but you'll get it with some practice. Uh, there's two methods of shooting the spinner and the, the one I prefer is where I dial the elevation to the spinner and I aim at the bottom target. I pick a good point of aim as the target coming towards me uh, and as the target is going starts to go away from me I break the shot trying to make that perfect timed shot. The second method to shoot in a spinner is where you measure from the bottom center of the target to the center of the bar. You're usually going to be right about two mils depending on the spinner. And so you're going to go ahead and dial two mils down on your scope. We have a spinner today at 270 yards. My dope is 0.7 of a mil. I'm going to dial that back up into my scope. Now if I got my crosshair centered on the bar, I'm going to impact the center of the bottom target. And the timing on the spinner is the same thing. You want to impact that spinner at its most vertical position so you can impact it with the most energy of your bullet. So you're going to break the shot as soon as the spinner starts going away from the shooter. I'm going to demonstrate how I shoot spinner. And what I want you to pay attention to is the bolt manipulation and the trigger control. Things are going to happen a little faster than normal. And that's because I want to be in the perfect timing when I hit it. Watch it. And we spun the spinner. Popper targets or targets of limited time exposure, those are the targets that are just going to appear for three to five seconds and you'll have a very short window to engage that target before that target disappears. Uh, there's also you're going to be shooting at some Turner targets, the targets that basically face uh, sideways to you, no engage time. And so there's a couple tricks and techniques that I use to engage those targets. When you engage the popper targets, more often than not, they're going to be a cardboard target. Uh, distances are going to be varying three to six hundred yards. Uh, it's very hard to see bullet holes or impact on the cardboard, so you have to learn how to rely and retrace uh, to engage that target. When you're shooting popper targets and it's windy, and if it's not switchy, uh, you should dial your wind correction into your scope. That way you can aim straight on on the popper target instead of holding off the target for wind. And if the wind is switchy, you just make minor adjustment with your crosshair. To conclude the moving target tutorial, I want to suggest a couple things to you. Uh, I personally try to go to every match that's a local monthly match that advertises to have a moving target. It doesn't cost you much and I bet they'll let you practice after the, after the match. Uh, it just takes a lot of practice on the mover. It takes that timing and to connect your brain to your trigger finger. When you say fire, that thing fires. Also, I wanted to suggest when you practice a mover that you learn how to spot your own bullet trace. It's going to help you when you have to engage some targets that are in front of the trees, tall grass, some sagebrush. In becoming proficient in shooting 
a moving target. There's just no shortcuts. You got to get out in the field, practice him enough, shoot him enough to where it becomes a second nature. And remember, miss is not an option.